Hello and welcome to the PCM Tech Help Show. I am your host, Greg Chamberlain, and in today's live broadcast, we're going to talk about your questions because that's what the live broadcast is for. It's for all of you wonderful viewers out there. Now, in a couple minutes, I'm going to be distributing the link to this live broadcast across all of my networks because I am the only one in the PCM Tech Help world. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, X Split and broadcasting at the beginning of the show. But of course, as the questions start coming in the actual YouTube channel, I will address those questions directly. Now, you'll notice I have some, made some slight changes here to the video feed. Uh, I'm working on optimizing my video feed for Google Plus Hangouts. Now, this has been a work in progress for a couple days, um, kind of like mulling over all my options and the configurations. I did discover that Google Plus Hangouts only supports 360p, so I'm going to go into more details on that a little bit later. But uh, again, the format here is pretty laid back. Nothing... Nothing like crazy professional or official needs to be asked. Uh, no questions or stupid questions. Uh, the whole point of this is to connect with you, my viewers, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about how I plan on breaking this up for you guys so you're easier, easier able to actually decipher everything in a video that we don't have to watch this whole feed in order to get the most out of it. Now, of course, if you're watching the feed, I appreciate your viewership, and... Uh, Pretty much anything you can do to post questions will always help. Um, and of course, liking the video is, is a, a huge stride uh, to make things keep going in the right direction for me. And this again, this is only episode six, so forgive me for all the bugs that we are going to be incurring. It is going to be an evolving process. I have an AV guide coming in over the weekend, and we're going to talk about actually building, uh, <clears throat> setting me up official lighting that isn't so harsh. And I'll have these shadows back here. You'll notice those are cast. Um, I mean, I could go through a whole thing today on what not to do when setting up <laughs> a studio, uh, but we won't uh, delve into those details just yet. Um, so let me go ahead and touch on XSplit here a little bit. First, let me distribute this on the network. Now, if you follow me on all the major social networks, uh, you will notice that I, before every episode, give you a 10-minute warning that the show is going to go live soon. And then what I do is, is I actually announce the official broadcast and at that point, I can just, you know, sit and wait for your questions while I banter. So let me go ahead and distribute this across my networks right now as we speak. It's going to be going live. And pretty straightforward. It says, broadcasting now, bring your questions. Send now. So that's going to go out to all my networks, and hopefully we get a pretty good turnout. Now, this is the first time I've done this 9 p.m. turnout, but this is, this is going to work out this 9 p.m. time slot, this is going to work out a lot better than the 4 p.m. one. I feel like I can be more comfortable at this time. I'm not as rushed. And uh, I'm also in a situation where I can actually, it's kind of the wind down time of the day. I think people are more looking for a generalized type uh, discussion. And I, I also think it'll just work out as far as the format's concerned because uh, three, 9 o'clock Eastern is, you know, East Coast 9 o'clock, and then on West Coast you're 6 o'clock. So at least you guys are have been off work for an hour, you're probably eating dinner. I'm sure you're all gathering around the television watching PCM Tech Help, Tech Talk Live. I hope to be someday, but I'm sure I'm not there today. So, <laughs> but we'll get there someday. Again, this is all a whip. We're in the whip process. Work in progress, work in progress, work in progress. So let's talk today about Google Plus Hangouts. Google Plus Hangouts, um, are broadcast in the full HD is not full HD. The maximum resolution is 360p. Now I'm not typically a live broadcaster, but I'm learning very quickly why they chose 360p. It's amazing what kind of hardware you need in order to actually broadcast in full 720p or 1080p. I attempted to use Livestream.com earlier today. I was testing it, uh, trying to do a 720p broadcast. Um, I might migrate to their service eventually, but I have a quad-core processor i7 on this bit, this bad boy, a nice GTX processor from NVIDIA, and it could barely handle broadcasting full 720p HD without chewing up the entire processor. Now, mind you, they do have some 3D rendering and production suites available from Livestream that may have contributed to that, but uh, the reason being is I was trying to broadcast my full 1080p desktop, as well as 720p video. So you have this dual processing going on and you gotta understand your computer's compressing the information and then 
sending it over the internet live through Ustream. I mean, I'm sorry, through live stream in this case. Um, so I ran into performance issues on my hardware, which was an interesting dilemma. I didn't expect that with this computer. So it might be a while before I go to 720p, and I do like the format that Google Plus has, and I don't doubt that eventually Google Plus will move into the 720p arena. I did discuss that in yesterday's video as well. So there's there's some things that are going to be going on in the future as far as YouTube is concerned and uh, Google Plus. They're going to meld together. And so I'll probably stick with this one, this format for quite some time. And uh, we'll see how it all goes. Uh, <clears throat> so XSplit is the software package I decided to use. For those of you who don't know what XSplit is, let me put, pull this up here on my screen and you guys can take a look at it. What I have here is XSplit is a video management suite that allows you to capture your camera ahead of time. You can probably see it right here on my desktop. At least I hope you can. Let me make sure. Yeah, it looks like you can. And what it does is it captures my screen right here and um, I can configure each device which is really nice. So, And I can do it uh, in real time. So right now I can see I can check my audio levels. I can check my, uh, my computer speaker levels. But it lets me add these elements and I can actually shift these elements throughout my video. So I can put that right over the top of my face. And if you guys are sick of looking at me, see? And it's kind of cool that you can really do the real time. I mean, you can't watch the feed right now because I'm showing you my desktop. But if, I, if you watch the, uh, the feed window in Google Hangouts, it would actually reflect that change immediately. Uh, it also has the option to add these text banners across the top, which is a very cool feature. Uh, for those of you listening to the show, uh, what it is is it's a scrolling marquee text. And I can customize the size and length of this text, where it shows up on the feed. I can move it up and down and I can actually expand and contract it and it'll make the text larger or smaller. So there's a lot of really cool things you can do with the texting mar text marquee and uh, that kind of allows you to add pretty much anything you want. Uh, I can even go in here while we're talking and I can configure the text marquee to show whatever I want. So right now I've got this big long line of text and since I chose black, the background color by default is black, uh, it's actually showing the uh, you can't see the text right now, but it does show it up in black on the top of my screen. So if I updated this right now, I could just click OK, and it, it does actually restart the marquee at the top of my video, and it updates it uh, in real time, the output to the camera. See, because what we're looking at right now is this is my feed. It captures my camera directly at this feed, and then it actually outputs this camera to a virtual camera. If I go up to Tools here and General Settings, there is a virtual camera output here. Uh, and if you see that, you'll notice that this virtual camera will become available for you to select on your Hangout. And so that's really a cool way to be able to manipulate your image prior to it showing up on your Google Plus Hangout or any live stream you might be considering doing. This will actually capture, capture your camera in advance, and then at that point you can manipulate the image here in LiveCam, I mean in XSplit, and then redistribute that video out to a device or a software package that you might be broadcasting to. Great way to manipulate your image and play around with it. There's a couple of other things you can do here that I haven't been fully satisfied with. They have a screen capture option. Notice it does a cool little segue into it, but notice it's it's actually it's got a different camera up here in the corner that I have captured, which is my webcam on my, uh, my actual desktop, if you notice that up there in the corner here to the top right. And it also has a screen region, so it's capturing my screen. What I don't care for this right now on XSplit is that it's actually not very high resolution. So what happens is, is when it outputs it, even if I select the full 1080p output resolution, this is very grainy when it's actually displayed on the overall screen. And there's a couple other elements you can add, and it does that nice little flow between elements. And you can do some pretty cool 3D effects in it as well. So I can actually drag this box any length I want. I can drag my camera over here to the left. This is, again, that's my embedded webcam. But I could technically add my Microsoft Life Cam to that as well. Um, and then I can actually go to positioning here. Uh, and I can actually play with some 3D elements. If I didn't want to do that, I could hold Shift. And I could actually make this like really kind of a cool 3D-esque style. See what I mean? And so while I'm moving my desktop, notice it's interactive. It's actually showing it on the screen here. I really wish I could get this to broadcast properly because this would be a cool way to kind of set up my stream. It looks a lot like the live stream setup, but, you know, I could set my image maybe down here in the corner and you guys could actually see 
what's going on. I obviously have to resize it so you can see what's really going on. But uh, that's kind of a, it's a really cool thing. That's not all you can do with it. You can do a lot of things with it. Uh, you can add all kinds of elements. You have your media file, screen region, IP camera. So if you have a remote webcam, uh, you can actually set it up for IP. You can add a game, a game capture of one of your video games. Skype video, a live stream, a separate live stream you might be monitoring while you're discussing it. Uh, title is what I did up here at the top, the marquee. And there's some other sources you can add as well. Now, there could be some things I'm doing wrong with the screen capture, and that's why it could also be the restriction that I have on the Google Hangout. Uh, but you'll notice that the screen capture on the Google Hangout is a lot nicer if you're actually using the screen share option that comes with Google+. But if I disable that, I go back to my live broadcast, which is pretty cool. I mean, there's a lot of really cool elements to it uh, that I think, I think are look, look, worth looking into. And I'm going to try to keep track of XSplit discussion. It was at the beginning of this video. Um, and it's more of an overview of the XSplit environment. Uh, let's see if you have any questions yet. Uh, and I expect a huge turnout today. Hello, AMRS3. Uh, it looks like that's all we've got so far. In, in, like, uh, in the middle of the day, I had about 15 consecutive viewers at all times. And again, this being a new time slot, I don't really anticipate a huge turnout the first time around. But don't worry, there's plenty of things we can discuss here other than just XSplit. So uh, it mo may, mostly what people like to talk about with things like this um, is I like to do the Leo Laporte thing. Uh, um, I'm more of a general tech guy, and I, I, like, I specialize in a lot of broad areas. I, I, I don't specialize in one area. I'm more of a broad tech guy. So I like to answer questions from a wide range of areas. Uh, I'm really excited about this because... It allows me to. It allows me to create a environment where I can answer questions on the fly and be challenged, and that's kind of always where I've thrived when it comes to tech help. I like to be. I like to be asked different types of questions at different times, and I like to. I kind of like to be put on the spot for questions too. So that kind of opens up. This opens up a whole new opportunity with that that never was available before. Um, What's really kind of cool, too, about a, a live setup is you don't run into a lot of confusion uh, when you're, you get the real me, you know, I, and you get, when you get the real person, the real deal, I feel like, you know, I'll tell you if I don't know something, you know, I, I don't, I don't know the answer. A lot of times I can figure it out right here, you know, using Google and researching, or I'll have a general idea and I'll know where to look. Uh, but usually I can try to push you into an area at least where you can ask the question or find the answer to the question because uh, there's a lot of professionals out there, a lot of information, a lot of information, a lot of resources, especially for tech help. And a lot of times it's just confusing where you can trust that information. Um, on that note, trusting information on the web, uh, where can you trust information on the web? Let me... Let me, let me write that down. I'm trying to keep track of things that I'm actually talking about so that I can put a timeline at the bottom of the video. People are like, will you please tell me when you talk about whatever? Um, trusting things on the web. Uh, there's a couple things I use. I use Web of Trust. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. And I use a Google Chrome extension that really, really kind of simplifies identifying whether or not you can trust a website when you visited it in the information. Uh, I like to start with PageRank, though. Uh, Web of Trust and PageRank in, co in combination. Now, there's a cool, a very cool plugin you can use or extension you can use for uh, Google Chrome. Let me pull it up here. I want to show you. And what you can do is, is you can pull up. Don't worry, I'll get to your questions here in a minute. I noticed that I've been, I really don't like this sometimes. This Google needs to straighten this out. I should be able to monitor. I should be notified when I get new questions pretty <laughs> you were, this is really something they should notify me of. Um, wow, really, didn't see it on my YouTube channel. I'm sorry, see, there's my ADD. Uh, 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 hmm, uh, hmm, okay, hmm, hmm, okay. Yeah, you should really notify me when you guys post a question, because this is kind of annoying. I can do the disable automatic updates, but that never works. Automatic updates never work. I'm going to complain. Let me pull up this Chrome extension, and then we'll get to your questions. Sorry. Sorry, again, I'm not I'm new at this. So let's pull up this cool Chrome extension. I want to show you guys this. It is called, what is it called? 
Well, it looks like I have two separate ones. I got the, the Watt. The Watt. Show me a rating window. Safe surfing. If I am on the web and I search for PCM Tech Help, well, no, we don't want to go there. Let's just do a Google search. Google.com. And I pull up, uh, how do I install a processor? Okay? What's cool about this Watt extension, Web of Trust extension, if you can see it here, let me make sure trust it yet, I haven't done it enough, is you see these little circles next to it that show up? This is very cool. I can actually gauge just on a little circle here um, what I can trust here on, uh, on a lot of the elements that show up. Now if it's something unreliable like Zango, let's do the Zango toolbar, wow, it actually didn't even show up with junk. If it's something unreliable, it'll be a uh, red circle. If it's something to be leery of, it'll be a yellow circle. So they kind of at least give you some foresight before you even click on the link. Now this Watt works with all your emails. It works with any website that has a link. So if you're wondering if you should click on that link, this will put a little circle next to it that will help you gauge whether you can trust it or not. Now it is based heavily on the user submission of these trust issues, but I've known it's a really great way to, at the blink of an eye, you can at least gauge some kind of a trust factor. The second thing I do when I'm looking to trust or not trust a website is in the top right corner you have, I have this really cool tool called Web WooRank. Uh, it's also an extension. Let me write those down so that I can actually put them in the video description after this video. Um, the Watt extension and WebRank, WooRank, Watt and WooRank. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to post links to those extensions. And WooRank is something you can actually click on when you're at a website, and you can actually tell right just by looking at it what their Alexa rank is, their Compete rank is, their Google Page rank is probably the number one factor that I use because Google is very rigorous in that number. If they're, if they're a four or higher, they're pretty darn reputable. That's hard to get for a lot of companies. You can see their social meter, how much they're engaged on social media, and there's a lot of other things you can check too. It even shows the Web of Trust rating right on there. It also shows the Site Advisor rank, and it's also got a Norton Safe Web rank. Now, depending on the site you're at, it might not show all of this information because if it's not a heavy traffic site, you don't know. So, like if I go to my website right now, PCMTechHelp.com, I guess I should have said that at the beginning of the site. In the top right hand corner, I can click on it, and I've got a page rank 4 out of 10. Uh, it says I'm in the 393,000, top 393,000. Web of Trust has question marks. Okay, that just means I don't have a lot of user-based submissions for my trust ranking. Norton Safe Web says I'm okay. Uh, Site Advisor, question marks. Now, I'm not this huge, uh, what is how-to geek. I'm not the big top dog, you know what I mean? So there's certain factors that I won't have, but it's a good thing I don't have bad things. So <laughs> this is a good tool, WooRank. Um, very cool tool, and if you're a web designer too, it's an essential tool to have because you can even do an SEO analysis and things like that, and you can look in, into more information there. Very cool tool to have. I highly recommend it uh, for people who are looking into trusting sites or not trusting sites. So let's go ahead and get to your questions here. I'd like to get things going here, and if they're not questions, I can at least address your, your comments. Um, Let's start from the top. Uh, Big Nate 84 cool, I'm glad you made it. Unfortunately, I'm sad you're missing American Idol. Actually, I kind of feel good about that. Somebody picked me over American Idol. You're watching both at the same time, aren't you? <laughs> I bet you are. Hey, I got a wife too, I get it, I know how it works. But uh, welcome to the live broadcast. I hope that the video feed is going through okay. Uh, it says, I saw your live feed on Google+, Plus, but not on the YouTube channel. Now, that's interesting. If I go to my YouTube channel here, let's see what we got going on. Um, you're not actually seeing me right now. I just realized that. But let's go to my YouTube channel, or pcmtechhelp.com slash YouTube is what I've been redirecting people to. And I've noticed that there's like an update delay here. Uh, yeah, see, that, that frustrates me too. That's a frustrating experience too. If you go to, if you're broadcasting live for Google Plus, this is a frustrating element. Uh, you have to show up how, let me write this down, how to get your live feed to show up on your YouTube channel. I believe you have to go to my feed section. So let me go to feed. 
It's under Featured right now. Uh, I should actually probably share my screen with you again, shouldn't I? I'll get the hang of this. I'll get the hang of this. Bear with me. Bear with me. Screen share. Desktop. Share selected window. Okay. Right now, by default, I have it set to Featured Videos. What we want it to be showing is my feed. I know there's a way to get that. Let me go to Browse Videos. Yeah, it's like hidden. Then I go to Feed. It's buried. There it is. Oh, oh, see how easy that was? See how easy that was? So really what I should be doing is, actually if you're a subscriber, it should bring you to the feed by default. But if it doesn't bring you to the feed by default, you have to go up to Channel Settings here, and you have to go to Info and Settings, and, no, Tabs, and Default Tab is Featured Tab. See, I, I screwed this up. This is my fault. So that's my fault that you couldn't find it. If it's a subscribed user or an unsubscribed user, I want it to default to the feed. That actually makes more sense if I'm going to be doing live broadcasting. And then I'm going to select Done Editing. Okay? And now, when you come to my page, you're going to be greeted with this screen, which says Broadcasting Now, Bring Your Questions. And it makes more sense. So, like, if for any reason you get disconnected, you can officially come through my channel and find my feed right here. So that's how you do it. Okay? Thank you for pointing that out to me. Obviously, I wasn't doing it right to begin with. And uh, that would have been bad. So my subscriber, subscribers, <laughs> my subscribers, weren't getting full access to my feed because I didn't have my YouTube channel set up correctly. So excellent thing to point out. I appreciate you giving me that feedback. Now, when you go back to my channel, you should be greeted with my feed, and my feed should show that I'm broadcasting live right now. And so, if you have a YouTube channel and you're contemplating doing Hangouts, make sure you change that to feed. Okay, something very important to do. Very important to do because you want people to see you. It uh, just makes sense. So let's see what we got going on next. Uh, David Pickard. Hey, Craig. Hope you're well, dude. Hope you're well too, David. Appreciate you stopping by. Pcom Fun Fan ninety seven. Do you make enough money here on YouTube? Define enough. Uh, excellent question. Um, let me write it down money you can expect to make from YouTube. The question being asked, of course, is do you expect to make a lot of money from YouTube? My immediate answer is it depends. Uh, I can't really say or give you a guarantee for the amount of money you're going to make. I've known people who have been on YouTube for six months and make livable incomes. Um, I know people who've been on it for three to four years and make uh, what you would make it like a part-time job. Um, there's a large amount of factors that come into Google and how they calculate how much money you generate. Uh, it's a complete sophisticated algorithm that's not meant to be manipulated so or predictable because it, the minute somebody can predict the infrastructure is the minute that they can manipulate it. Okay, So Google does invests a lot of money in making sure that they can deliver reliable ads to people who are trustworthy, page rank being one of them factors, and deliver high quality results to the people who are paying for that ad space. Because they don't want to create a product that in the long run will actually end up hurting their people who are paying for ad space. They're the most important people in this entire process. Yes, I'm a publisher. Yes, I generate content. I'm, I'm an important player in that but I don't pay for the ad space. They're paying me. So they're the paying customer, and so Google has to default to them for trustworthiness and reliability. Now, the amount of money you're going to make on YouTube is directly proportional to a number of factors, least of which is manipulating AdSense. Uh, comes down to original content, being able to get a viewership or a viewer base, having regular viewers, having a large number of viewers, uh, and just having ad videos that are relevant to ads that just so happen to be high paying ads or niche ads, I like to call them. I know a couple people who generate content that's very niche, very targeted focus. So like if you're in tech but you do tech help based on like web servers exclusively, like you're a web server 2008 enthusiast specialist, your ads are going to be revolved around that target niche market, which strengthens your actual revenue in most cases. Because niche advertising is more targeted and more focused, so people are willing to pay more for that ad space, as opposed to like generalized tech. So 
it, it depends on a lot of factors. Me personally, I can't. I'm not allowed to disclose the amount of money. It's actually against the AdSense terms of service. Um, I don't feel like I'm being treated unfairly. If that's your question, I feel like I'm getting out of it what I'm putting into it. Uh, but I do understand how the system works. Uh, and really the whole process of becoming a partner and generating ad revenue is a process of your creative effort to generate original quality content that's only your own and a combination of timing and luck does play a factor but a combination of how much ad space is being paid for at whatever time of day, that year, that niche, that market it's unpredictable in a lot of ways, but once you've gotten your feet wet, once you've exposed yourself and created your content and you're a partner and you've started to build up kind of a following, you start to gauge what your niche is kind of worth. You can, they give you the tools to study what videos make the most money. You can study what your most popular videos are, how much content's been generated, how many, how many minutes are watched. They give you all kinds of tools to gauge as a content creator what's successful and what's not. And then you can change your focus to generate more or less money. Uh, it really depends on if you're money driven or content driven. I prefer to do what I'm passionate about rather than just what makes money. So again, that's going to play a factor as well. So I know that wasn't exactly your question. I hope actually my elaboration kind of at least enlightened you. But the process of becoming a YouTube partner is relatively simple, but it's not easy to become a YouTube partner. The process of applying is easy. You can just go to youtube.com slash partner, and that's where you can actually apply for a partnership. Uh, and then usually you have to meet their subset of criteria. Let's see what that criteria is here real quick. If I pull it up here, let's go to screen share again. Let's share my desktop. And we're going to go to youtube.com slash partner. And they have a partner program. And here it's Get Started. It says Develop Your Talent. Uh, YouTube partner program creators with resources, opportunities to improve skills, build a larger audience, earn money. It's YouTube partners, you'll join a global community, blah, 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 blah. That's more of a selling point. Guidelines. Here we go. This is more important. To become a partner, content creators must abide by YouTube's community guidelines. Admission to the program varies by country. Learn more about which process applies to you or simply get started. Community guidelines means that you aren't stealing content. There's a whole slew of things you need to make sure that you're adhering to, uh, and that's a very important thing to make sure that you're doing. Um, and it says at the bottom here, as a YouTube partner, we expect you to comply with the terms of service, community guidelines, and other partner program policies. Now, if we go to get started here, and eh, see, it's already going to bring up information about my account. We don't, we don't want that. So I would have to actually... Let me bring in, open a different browser, different browser. I've done that so many times. Let's go to youtube.com slash browser, uh, partners. Wow. And then I'll select get started on here. And they'll make you log in. And I don't know if they even disclose the information here because uh, I don't want to... Good, my password's already in there. I didn't want to type it out. Didn't want to type it out in a live stream. Uh, I don't want to use my full name. Uh, it's asking me to connect Google+. Plus. Okay. It's not enabled. Enabling your account does allow you to... Blah, 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 blah. Okay, just more guidelines and information. As a rule of thumb, what I've been told and before I got approved is you should have at least 100,000 views, total views, you should be generating regular content, and your content should be all your own and all original. This doesn't. This probably won't give you specifics because it varies so much. The approval varies so much based on the person who's actually considering applying for the partnership. There's been people who have 10 videos who've been approved for partnership. There's been people who have 1,000 videos who've been declined for partnership. So I guess I can't really even say that's an absolute guideline. Uh, apply if you don't get it, I think they make you wait three months, apply again. So apply when you think that you've got a professional image that you're illustrating. So let's go ahead and move on to the next question. I think I've spent enough time on that one, uh, and I hope that answers your question. Uh, I use XSplit for streaming too, says David Pickard. I'm really happy with it so far. I think this video is, is I think it looks okay, uh, especially since I've only really been playing with XSplit for a day. I like, I like that I've been able to kind of create something out of it. Uh, in such a short period of time. I think the more I use it, the better it's going to get. Uh, like I was saying earlier in the video, I'm a little disappointed that I can't 
it, it doesn't seem to do a very good job of, of broadcasting your screen capture. And that could have something to do with the way Hangouts renders it, too. So I can't blame it entirely on XSplit. I think if I, maybe I was broadcasting to a full 1080p service, you'd see it. But I have some, some minor frustrations there, but it could also be operator error at this point. But XSplit is, is fantastic for this broadcasting so far. I'm very happy with it. Uh, J- Jose TV Productions says, what is your name? I should probably have that somewhere on here, shouldn't I? Craig Chamberlain. It is on here. It is on here, right? I got my screen. I'm not scaring. I'm not sharing my screen again. I did it again. Did it again. Did it again. I did it again. Um, my name is Craig Chamberlain, and I do like Expo so far. It's pretty good stuff. Uh, so let's go up to. You were the first one I trusted to do with PC. Appreciate that, David. And 20 tips for faster Windows 7. I did all. That's kind of good to hear. That was actually a really popular video out of all the ones that I did. Um, And I need to do another one for Windows 8. Uh, I've gotten a lot of pressure on that, and it's going to be coming up in the spoiler alert. Uh, Windows 8 Faster 7 Series upcoming. I'll type that out here. Uh, When am I going to do a Faster, Faster 8 Series? Probably in the next month. It'll be either... Beginning to mid-February, I'm going to start that series up. And I've done this. I've told this a number of times. The reason I haven't done this, I'm not comfortable enough with Windows 8. I haven't benchmarked my my optimizations enough to be comfortable with suggesting a full tilt guide. Uh, I'd like to do it the similar way I did the 20 tips for Windows 7 series I did as a playlist on here. Um, But I think I'll probably do both this time. I've got to come up with a way. I might do one full optimization of Windows 8, like one full live stream video, and I might break it up into different parts. I'm thinking about doing it that way, which would be pretty cool because you guys could watch it live in action. Whoa, clicking action. Check that out. That's fantastic. And uh, then I could cut it up into separate videos, and if people who are only interested in like certain areas will at least be able to get that information for Windows 8. So I think that might be a cool way to do it. I've been tossing around different format ideas but I will be doing a faster Windows 8 series. That is going to happen. Um, Now, for those of you who don't know what the faster Windows 8 series is, uh, I'm going to tell you guys. It's a... how I'm making notes here. I optimize Windows operating system. It is a series that I did. I put together. I have a number of them. I have one for Windows XP, Windows Vista, and Windows 7. I've been working with computers for about... Carry the system. Here the nine, 15, 15 to 18 years. I don't know the exact number because I can't remember when I played King's Quest V on Windows 95 for the first time. One of those cool screensaver games. Uh, but uh, I've accumulated over time a whole slew of steps that I go through every time somebody asks me a tech question or a computer question or an optimization question. And what really how, how PCM Tech Help started was that I got tired of answering the same questions and optimizing people's computers over and over again. So what I did is, if you look at my my website, I put a whole bunch of free software tools on a website. It was a really junky, crappy website at the time, and I've updated it since then, thank goodness. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of changes since then, but I created three separate video series, three separate series of videos, and I put them right on my website. If you look at the free downloads, that's all the downloads that will be in the Faster 7 series. Uh, they're all available right there in the drop-down. But if you look down here at the bottom of my screen, I've got the free downloads on the left-hand side on this little floating toolbar, and I've got a Faster XP, Faster Vista, and Faster 7 series buttons there as well. So you can select them, and actually at that point, it'll walk you through. So if I click Faster XP, for example, it'll bring up the most recent episode that was published. Now, If you want to get to the very first episode and work your way forward, you can go down here and click on the last page. It's page 5, the bottom of the section. And how to create a Windows system restore point is the first video. So you can actually watch these videos one after another after another, and it will actually walk you through step-by-step optimizing your Windows XP hard drive. These are my most popular videos that I've done as far as a video series is concerned. And it's a great guide if you have a lot of family members who ask you how to optimize XP Vista or 7. Okay, all three of these guides work. Now, if you're not comfortable with my layout, there's some things that frustrate me about it. I don't like that it shows the most recent first. I'm not a PHP programmer or proficient in it, so I can't change that. 
you can go to pcmtechhelp.com slash YouTube. And then I usually tell people to go to my featured video section here if you go to the top left. And on the bottom right-hand corner of the featured, I got all these playlists. Okay, I organized them all in playlists right on YouTube. And you can just click the series you want to watch. Uh, so if I want to watch Faster Vista, I'll click on that playlist on the right-hand side. And boom, you've got them all right in order. I mean, really, this is a very comfortable way to watch it. Uh, you can click the individual video and, and start watching right from there. Excellent way to actually watch in great detail how to optimize a machine, and it will bring you through everything, uh, everything that I could think of anyway. Uh, very well received, and I appreciate you bringing it up because a lot of people don't realize that I even have this available. And so it's really kind of a something I, I'm kind of proud of. <laughs> and one of the few things that I brag about on here uh, but uh, it's it's been a lot of fun to make, and I'm going to be doing updates of those video, those series of video as I continue to progress because things change. So that that's a, a very cool thing. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad it. I hope it helped you out. Hope it didn't drive you crazy. And um, I'm glad you brought it up because you allowed me to do a shameless plug. I always appreciate that. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Use Norton Advisor. Yes, that's I do. Rec uh, I kind of recommend Norton Advisor. Norton Advisor can be a little intrusive, although Norton's made astounding strides actually in the past couple of years. They used to be a nightmare to work with. They have really good database definitions now. The problem is, essentially, the biggest in the market. They're the, the biggest target when it comes to anti to viruses. So usually, Norton McAfee are the first ones to get shut down by a virus. So when you go mainstream on virus protection. A lot of times you can you risk that, uh, and I can elaborate on that a little further. Should you go mainstream on a virus, <laughs> on an antivirus? Uh, the answer to this question is is maybe um, going mainstream on an antivirus can create a lot of issues for you down the line, uh, because when I'm a software programmer, I'm trying to infect the largest number of mach machines as possible. I'm going to write a virus that attacks a vulnerability of the most popular antiviruses that are out there in the market. I'm not going to write a virus for the uh, Komodos. I'm not going to write a virus for the ESET, NOD32s, the Avasts. I might because Avast is becoming really popular. I'm going to write a virus for the McAfee's and the Nortons mostly because they, they hold such a large, significant portion of the market share that it makes more sense for me economically to write a virus that infects those machines because uh, I can make the most damage. Uh, so really that's the risk you run with the mainstream. However, since those mainstream antiviruses are the most prominently attacked, they're also typically the most well defended internally, assuming they're doing proper management, which Norton wasn't doing for a while. Which means that if they're proactive about those attacks and those vulnerabilities, as they find them, they patch them more, and in the long run, they end up with a much more secure database and better virus database. You see what I mean? Antivirus database. So McAfee has done a terrible job of this. McAfee is a terrible antivirus software package. It's just terrible. Um, and I'm, usually I don't just say that about software, but it's, not, it's all around not a good antivirus. If you want to go commercial, you can go at Norton. If you got Norton already, you've paid for it, stick with it. I like Avast. It's not top of the line, but it's free. Avast free antivirus that's at my website under the free download section. Um, I recommended Avira for a while, and I've kind of gone back on that. Avira is obnoxious, displays a lot of ads. AVG has gone up and down. They're kind of a roller coaster. Uh, if you're going commercial, Kaspersky is always a good option. Komodo is a good option, uh, and ESET NOD32 is one of my favorites. And they're, I think they're a Swedish com a company, or the, the Netherlands. It's, it's somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> if anything's like far out in the ocean or across the ocean, it's the middle of nowhere to me, just so you know. Um, but they're a great small company, very, very low performance antivirus. It's great for mid-grade systems because the antivirus is non-obtrusive non and it doesn't suck out a bunch of resources. So NOD32 is worth looking into as well. So as far as mainstream antiviruses go, you can go both ways on that. There's some advantages and disadvantages. So at the end of the day, it's going to be whatever you feel most secure using. 
and you should probably go with something that tests pretty decently or rates pretty high. So I hope that answers at least addresses some concerns with Norton and McAfee because I noticed you mentioned the side advisor here. So what other plugin would you recommend? If you got Site Advisor, if you got Site Advisor and you've got Web of Trust and you're using WooRank, you're pretty darn secure when it comes to securing your browser from any kind of scariness. I, I mean, obviously, you want to move away from Internet Explorer at all costs. That goes back to the mainstream thing. Um, they're the number one target of attacks because it's the most popular browser in the market. That's shrinking. Um, but since they are the most popular browser in the market, they tend to be the first ones to get infected. Uh, I like to go to Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox. That will give you additional protection on top of your plugins or extensions. Now, that should cover you. If you've got Web of Trust and you've got WooRank, you've got Site Advisor, and you're using a secure browser, I mean, you're doing pretty good. You might actually be a little paranoid at that point. So. I'd probably say you're, you're good there. Uh, next question. Daniel Unota, do you have any types of introduction video? I haven't seen all your videos. I wasn't sure. I do not have one yet. Uh, I have a video guy who can do one for me. And I'm going to try to get him to do one for me in the next couple of months because I would like to have an intro because pretty much anybody who's anybody has an intro. If I do an intro... It's going to have to be short. I'm talking like 5, 10 seconds because there's nothing more aggravating than a long intro. So I'm kind of obsessive, compulsive when it comes to things like that. I'm a perfectionist, which might be why the guy I want to do it hasn't done it for me yet. Maybe he's, maybe he's afraid that I'll critique it too much. Uh, if you're watching this, I will. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there are a lot of reasons to have an intro, and I will eventually have one. No, I do not have one yet. Thanks for asking, Daniel, and I will get one eventually. David Pickard, who is your favorite YouTuber? Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, and this is going to be embarrassing for me to say, uh, I'm not writing this down because somebody's going <laughs> to... Who is your favorite YouTuber? This is a good personal question, so I'm going to want to post a actual short link to this. Who is my favorite YouTuber? I don't have a lot of time to watch YouTube, which is kind of embarrassing because I'm doing a live stream right now hoping that people will watch me. Uh, but I've got two kids, uh, a wife. I actually work full-time. This is a part-time gig, and I'm trying to do five episodes in a week and manage my website and do a lot of things. But when I do get on there to watch YouTube, I stick to the short, pithy guys. I like Leo Laporte. I like Chris Perillo. I like Eli the Computer Guy. I like Machinima. I like... Oh, off the top of my head, that's like the top four. And usually by the end of that, if I try to keep up with their content, I'm out of time. Uh, Leo Laporte does a, po a podcast like once a week, and he's great. He's, he's just great. Um, he's very, very informed, uh, and he's also very... He's got the heart of a teacher, which I'm a fan of. Um... Chris Perillo has made, I mean, I'm part of his Nomies group. He does a professional broadcasting group, mastermind group called the Nomies, and it's it costs an annual fee, but it's priceless, the amount of information you get out of it. And as a professional and, and as a person with a his personal broadcasting philosophy, he's probably my favorite as far as I would say on YouTube because I really like that he models everything after himself. He's more of a, I'm a personal broadcaster. I do what content I'm passionate about and what I'm interested in. And he doesn't let his content fluctuate heavily based on user feedback. And I, I respect that, I think, is one of the biggest things to do with there. Um, and, I mean, that, I, I hate to say it, but I, I don't have a lot of time. Oh, Linus Tech Tips, I like him. I like him a lot. Um, Hack, what's his name? A household Hacker, awesome. Uh, trying to think, man, off the top of my head, this is a, <laughs> it's a tough one. But I think that's five or six of them that, that I would say are probably my favorites. So I hope that, uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Tom Crooks, I've learned so much from you, I've impressed my friends, and that's what it's all about. Actually, 
The great thing about having an online source is being able to use that information as if it's your information. Um, acquiring knowledge is the single most important thing you can do as a budding IT person or a budding anything in whatever you're doing. Exposing yourself to any form of knowledge. I don't know everything. In fact, there's a lot of things I know very little about. And the more you watch me, you will learn what things I have a weakness in and what I don't. I will admit them most of the time. But exposing yourself to a wide array of people, that's why I listen to Leo Report. that's why I listen to Chris Perillo, that's why I listen to Eli the Computer Guy. All these guys have proficiencies in a broad range of areas that I'm weak in, and I can learn and acquire that knowledge. And the more you expose yourself to these resources that otherwise, without the internet and technology, you never would have had, you just become smarter just through saturation. You just absorb it over time. It, I mean, I absorb it because I'm passionate about it. So obviously, if you're watching a live stream of me, you're mildly interested in technology. So I would encourage you, if you like technology, to continue to do that. Continue to expose yourself to these people, not in a very creepy or stalkery kind of way, but in a way where you will continue to absorb that information. Some of us will be wrong. Some of us will be right. But if you're well-rounded in your knowledge absorption, then you can actually start to think constructively and critically about all these topics. That will make you an invaluable asset in whatever career you choose. And I think that principle applies universally to whatever you decide to do in the long term as a job and as an individual. Uh, because there's one thing. Somebody told me this once. Actually, it was my father. <laughs> it's one thing that they can never take away from you, and that is your knowledge. So if you have any knowledge-gaining opportunities at work, at home, at school, jump on them while you can, because at the end of the day, that's what you've got. That's your selling point, what you know. And that's one thing that they won't ever be able to take away from you. They can fire you. They can take away your job, take away your car, your house, all that stuff. They'll never be able to take away what you know. And that makes you dangerous. Very dangerous. So something to think about. Something to think about. Acquiring knowledge. I'm going to make a note of that because I think it's very important that you guys should do that. I think everybody should try to do that from time to time. Okay. Um, uh, Allegra Dance asks, Dude, do I need a computer to be here? Dude, I don't think so. I think you can watch me on your iPad or your mobile device. I'm pretty sure Google Plus Hangouts and live streams on YouTube support any mobile device. Correct me on here if I'm wrong, but I don't think you have to be here uh, in order to get that information. So let's go ahead and scroll up here some more. Tom Prokes asks, can you do a Ping Guy 12.04 video? Oh my. I'm going to have to Google this. You know how I said I don't know any, everything? Ping Guy 12.04. Ping Guy. Download Ping Guy OS. A final Ping Guy, because your computer is meant to be easy. Images for final release of Ping Guy OS. Whoa, are you kidding me? This is an operating system? Ping Guy offers unparalleled beauty with many customizations and fantastic themes installed by default. Make others say, wow, what's that? I'm sold. That's a good elevator pitch. It's a Linux distribution that's built on the Ubuntu framework. i got to show you guys this. This is very cool. Who suggested this? Who suggested this? Ping Guy... Tom Prokes, I'm, I'm giving you credit for this when I do this. Uh, Ping Guy OS 12.04 from Tom Prokes. Okay, Tom, this is very cool. I'm going to share my screen, oops, screen share here with you because I want to show you guys this. I'm gonna, uh, Ping Guy OS apparently is a Linux distribution available for download that is built on the Ubuntu framework. It was created by Antoni Norman, and Antoni is still the lead developer of the project today. The ethos is very simple, to look good, work well, and most importantly, to be simple to use. I like it. So if I click on this, do I get to look at the picture? I do. Picture. Looks very clean. Looks like a cool little operating system that might be interesting to look at. Uh, if I go to downloads here, this is pinguyos.com. Looks like there's a 32 and 64-bit version. For those of you who are wondering, always use 64-bit if given the option. Um, and your processor supports it. Uh, another cool thing is if you, if you don't want to reinstall your entire operating system, 
Uh, an operating system like this can be installed using a cool little piece of software known as Oracle's VirtualBox. I have this at my website as well. Uh, if you go to virtualization, I think, pcmtechhelp.com slash, eh, I'll just go to pcmtechhelp.com. And I'm running low on time here. I'm going to start shooting through your questions here. I go to free downloads. We're going to do operating systems. And virtualization is VirtualBox. Uh, you can download Oracle VirtualBox. But you can actually install guest operating systems like Pinguy OS right on your operating system. And I'm going to have to check this out. I don't have an opinion on it. But uh, I'm going to have to check it out. Um, XBreed1990 asks, AMD versus NVIDIA? Wow, that's a loaded question. Whew. Graphics card wars. Let's talk a little bit about graphics card wars. Oh, 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 I'm having some confusion here. Let's drop out the cameraman, drop out the YouTube. AMD versus NVIDIA. Extremely loaded question. Personally, I'm an NVIDIA guy, but it depends on the season. It depends on the release. It depends on the system. Depends on the driver. Depends on the game. So you're running into a lot of factors here. I've had a lot more luck with NVIDIA historically with performance um, drivers and overclocking. But that could have just been my luck. Do you see what I mean? So I don't want to say NVIDIA all the time. I want to say I use it more often. I trust it more. But I have more history with it. Um, but it's a loaded question. Graphics cards are such sophisticated pieces of hardware. They're so hardware and system dependent now. They do so much on their own that benchmarking them and comparing them has to be done seriously on an exclusivity basis. I mean, you have to sit down and say, what's my system, what's my configuration, and what's the best bang I can get for my buck out of this? Because you can have bottlenecks at the processor, you can have bottlenecks at the memory, you can have bottlenecks at the bus speed, you can have bottlenecks on your memory speed, not just your memory size or quantity. You can have uh, bottlenecks at your processor or your hard drive speed. I mean, there's a lot of factors that come into play. So when you're talking NVIDIA versus AMD, the answer is it does depend heavily on what you're doing, and what you're playing, what drivers you're using, and what the practical application is. It's kind of a cop-out answer, I know, but if you have more specific, what do you think of this graphics card versus this graphics card, I can help you out more, but I'm still going to have to do some research because I don't have the time to do all of that all at once. You see what I mean? So uh, excellent question. Uh, dude, my epidermis is showing. What are you talking about? Yeah, it is. I agree. Allegra <laughs> Dance. GD Hosey. It's Greg Bleepin' Chamberlain. That's cool. The Duke, 1724, says, Hey, Craig, what are your thoughts on the new licensing ideas Microsoft has come up with their next version of Windows? How it won't be licensed, only rented, to use as a yearly subscription? Well, the Duke, I have I can't verify that information. I think they might be tossing the idea around. I don't know if it's been confirmed or not. You can go ahead and post a link here if I'm incorrect on that. But I think it is a very terrible, 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 terrible idea. Um, people aren't going to pay for a license for an operating system. Okay, people will do that, but not happen. Okay? And the more readily available Chrome desktop OS has become and Apple Macs become so seamlessly integrated with tablets, and Linux distributions like Ubuntu become more mainstream and popular. It looks like this pin guy one's pretty cool too. All completely free, you know. People are going to start looking for alternatives if they keep hammering stuff down their throat like Windows 8, and now all of a sudden yearly licensing? Is that true? Is that for Windows 8? Because if I miss that memo, I'm going to be very upset. So verify that for me if you can. Because, whoa, that's insanity to me. Absolutely, absolute insanity, if that's the case. How do computers fit in your life? Every facet of my life has computers in it somewhere, somehow. It's very depressing. Um, I have an iPad. I have an iPhone. Doesn't mean I don't like Android phones. Had an Android phone. Love my Android phone. I have a PC desktop. Thinking about getting a Mac. 
I have a three webcams. This one's my favorite one that I'm using right now. Um, I have like three wireless mice, actually two of which are connected to this computer because I don't want to switch mice when I get to, the work, to my work. <laughs> I have uh, an integrated webcam here. I guess that makes it four. Uh, I have, uh, oh, I have an Apple TV, which by the way is pretty sweet if you have a, an Apple tablet because you can stream all of your information from your tablet or your phone or your music directly to your television. And then when you take photos, you have like a gallery which is pretty awesome. I have this thing on my head most of the day, which I'm pretty sure isn't a good thing. I haven't read the studies in great enough detail. Uh, and this lets me talk to Siri, who is my personal assistant. I work with computers from 7 in the morning till 5 p.m. Then I come home and my wife yells at me for not getting off my phone. And then now, every night at 9 p.m., I am doing a live broadcast over the Internet about the same computers that I spent from 7 to 5. So I guess it answers another one of my buddies' question of, how do you know all this information? I'm just pretty much saturated in it all day long, and I love it. I can't, I can't get away from it. Absolutely can't get away from it. Excellent question. It's a cool personal question. I would say it permeates it pretty heavily. So... Pcom Fun Fan 97 says, did you create your website by yourself or did someone else to make it? I use WordPress. Um, WordPress is an excellent, excellent tool for building websites and constructing websites without having to know scripting or anything like that. WordPress is, is, in my opinion, one of the coolest inventions in the history of web design because it's created a, a environment for me to thrive as a content creator. Rather than worrying about building a website, coming up with a design, uh, integrating videos and audios into all my posts, coming up with cool little side widgets that will make my users experience better, categorizing them, organizing them, creating posts, editing posts, updating posts, uploading images, uploading videos, uploading, I mean, anything you can imagine now, WordPress will do almost automatically for you. For example, today, I was looking on there for a way to aggregate my feed onto iTunes, and there's a plugin for it. So I can literally take this live stream upload it straight to my WordPress interface, and it'll automatically distribute it to iTunes. I mean, that's it's amazing to me. WordPress has overhead issues, of course, but for what you get. Uh, I didn't design the layout myself, no. Press75.com is where I bought mine from. It cost me 75 bucks. And since it's WordPress, I can go in and customize the PHP and tweak the user interface however I want, assuming that you buy a license that's allowed to be used for commercial use. So I went in and did a lot of tweaking and adjusting for my personal setup, but I didn't design the site. No, that's something left to my betters, and I'll happily distribute that because I did web design for a while. Did not like it. It's not for me. Extremely, extremely frustrating, actually. So uh, that would be hopefully the answer to that question. Let me get back to my chat here. Good question, good question. Did you make your website, or who designed it? Because I'd like to give Press75 credit for that one. Uh, they did a great job on this theme. So let me go to the next question. From ADMRS3, the Faster Series has helped me tremendously, from Windows 95 all the way to Windows 7. I'm not tech savvy, but they made it easy for the guy that is more used to grease and motor part than touchy electronics. I'm glad to hear that. I tried to make them as straightforward as possible. Now remember, I created the Faster 7 series and the Faster XP and the Faster Vista series solely for individuals who don't know a whole lot about computers. But it touches on subjects advanced level enough to hopefully interest intermediate to expert users. Um, I did do like a shortened version of it, a consolidated 20 tips in 10 minutes one for Windows 7 that did really well. And I really need to do that for more of them, I'm thinking. But uh, it, it was a lot of fun to make, and I now redirect friends and family members who have computer problems, so it saved me a lot of time, actually. So that was why I actually ended up creating that. It wasn't, wasn't really actually to make a popular channel. This sort of all just happened on accident after the fact. So next question, Adam Trailer, Do you know of an iPhone app that allows you to back up an entire text stream? Text stream. Do you mean your actual instant messaging text? Because I know there's like an SMS backup, I believe is what I used before. Let me do a quick Google here. I used a backup. It's a backup and restore. 
Is it on iPhone? I think it's called iPhone. SMS backup. Uh, actually, it looks like Apple Support Communities has a forum on here, a thread. So forgive me. Give me one second. Um, you, if you back up your device to your Apple device, you can actually back up your texts. So if you actually do a full backup to your iTunes interface, it looks like it does back up your um, texts. But there's an iPhone SMS backup and restore is what it's called. Uh, you can buy a whole utility, it looks like, download. I don't really have a free alternative to that. Off the top of my head, no, I don't. I've never actually done it. Um, so you kind of stumped me on that one. I'm going to have to look into it and get back to you. That's Adam Trailer, by the way, one of my writers. I think he secretly knows what questions I don't know the answer to, and he waits for these moments to ask me. So I'm almost positive you can do it through iTunes. Have you had bad luck doing it that way? I think you can just do a full backup on iTunes and it'll let you do it. Okay, Adam Trailer then says, I don't use virus protection at all. I'm a Mac. I enjoy not worrying about it too much. Yes, you do have the luxury of not having to worry about it because Apple closes the Mac platform in a lot of ways. that makes it less flexible, which isn't always a bad thing, but it makes it a lot more stable and a lot more secure. So that would be why you are fully enjoying yourself on your Mac. It is true. You don't have to worry about security and viruses nearly as much. Reb1990 says, can your Apple's machines really get viruses? Of course, any machine can get a virus. Uh, they're a lot less likely to. A lot less people are inclined to get to write viruses for a Mac because there's a lot less of them out in the marketplace. And uh, like I said, the operating system is so tightly controlled by Apple in the way they distribute their hardware and software. Um, that it actually is a lot more secure of a platform. It's a lot more difficult to write viruses for it. So them two factors are heavily are taken into consideration when you're talking about viruses on a Mac versus PC. Um, so I, it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like a catch twenty uh, two. I've talked about that before. Um, and what you get when you actually go into detail on that is Macs don't always have the best ability but they quite often have the best stability and security. And what I mean by that is take your, take your PC, take your Mac. Um, no, no, take an iPad and Android tablet. It's the same idea, okay? Can you change your browser on an iPad? No. Can you change your default browser? Can you even change your default browser on a Mac without really hacking it or cracking it? Uh, I mean, there's these basic functions that you have the flexibility at on a PC, this customization flexibility, that allows it to be a more flexible operating system. And what it does is it actually reduces the security of that operating system because that information is accessible from a person writing a virus as well. So if that information is accessible from the execution of a software application and it's not locked out by the kernel it's called, then it is more vulnerable when it comes to actually being infected by viruses. So that does make Mac inherently a more secure, a more secure platform across the board. Uh, even for Apple devices compared to Google Android, um, the iPhone and iPad are more secure than the app, the Android phone and the Android tablets. Uh, same goes for Mac versus PC. And that's gonna be continue to be a truth unless Microsoft decides to start locking heavily down its operating system, which will hurt a lot of software designers and developers, and it'll also hurt a lot of users with software that they use on a regular basis. So, and, and it'll also make it tied not to just one specific hardware set, because Mac makes you use their hardware for the most part, until they finally released a version that'll work with an Intel PC, which is kind of sweet. I got a virtual machine on it. So they've at least moved away from that which is kind of cool. So uh, they can get viruses, yes, but it's extremely rare. Um, ADMRS3, I've asked on every computer in my house, thanks to your heads up and recommendation, I'm very pleased. I like Avast, I've enjoyed it pretty thoroughly over the years, and they've done a pretty decent job keeping up. It's not as comprehensive as a, a paid for, but it, it does offer deep, good protection, uh, much better protection over McAfee, so uninstall McAfee if you have it. Uh, Allegra Dan says, dude, I can make an intro for you. I would like to see some of your demos prior to approving an intro for me because I'm very picky. So 
Uh, if you can send me some demos, Craig at PCMTechHelp.com, I will take a look at them, and uh, we can go from there. Uh, Red 1990, why are circuit boards or motherboards green? I do not know. That is a good question. I wonder if there's... That's a good question. Why are circuit boards green? It's at the top of Yahoo Answers. Why are they green? It's a solder ma solder mask. They are available in many colors, including I'm stealing this answer from Yahoo, just so you know. Uh, that's answers.yahoo.com slash question slash index question mark QID equals 20910022455508, A, capital A, capital A, small I, F, N, N, zero. Okay? I gave credit. <laughs> if referring to the physical green color of the board, it indicates it's made of glass epoxy, which is naturally greenish in color. Backlight PCB is brown and difficult to work with with regards to cutting, sawing, and a size. Glass epoxy boards, on the other hand, are easy to work with and don't break and splinter. Wow, very interesting. The purpose is to protect the copper layer from corrosion and provide good insulation. Wow. See, this is why I love these live streams. I learn something new every day. I never would have known that. Excellent question. Excellent question. You guys are awesome. I'm, running, I'm out of time, actually. I'm, I'm going over here. Uh, what's the difference between a hardware and software? Okay, I'm going to zing through these last few because I've got to stop. You guys are going to have to show up tomorrow. It's going to be 9 p.m. again, uh, but I'm going to zing through them. If you want me to elaborate, you're going to have to show up tomorrow. Okay, wire circuit boards green. We did that one. What's the difference between a hardware and software firewall? Hardware is usually integrated as a firmware package in the device. So a router usually has a hardware firewall. Okay, so if you have a router sitting in front of your computer, then the router physically is blocking, since it's a piece of hardware and the firmware on it is blocking remote attacks and things like that, and many, many open insecure ports. That is your hardware firewall in front of your computer. Now, once the connection reaches your computer, then you're at a point where your Windows firewall is a software package installed onto your operating system that software-wise you can manage incoming and outcoming flow of traffic. Zone Alarm, which is also available on my website in the download section, is a hardcore free fi uh, firewall software package that allows for complete customization, almost to a fault, and that again is a software firewall. So it's not truly hardware, it's not like there's a physical barrier somewhere, but it's a piece of hardware that has firmware or software on it that allows for protection. That is the difference. David Pickard says, wow, wow, somebody, my father, I have a very, very poor short-term memory, so I'm sure that was in reference to something we discussed and I already forgot. The retarded horse says, hey, welcome back. The men in black can take away what you know. Oh, my God. You're absolutely right. I'm kind of wondering if they already have. What if... No. We won't even elaborate on that because I don't want them showing up at my house. So we're going to say they don't exist, and you're never allowed to say that in chat again. Okay. What's a good free antivirus from video computers? If you weren't watching earlier, if you go to my website, pcmtechhelp.com, we're going to do a screen share here again. We are going to pcmtechhelp.com. In the free download section right at the top of the screen, there's a drop-down menu. You can go to anti-malware is what I call it because it's just malicious software. And there's full suites. You have Avast, Avira, AVG, Komodo, Microsoft Security Essentials, and Super Anti-Spyware, which isn't an antivirus, but it is a suite. I recommend Avast if you want a free antivirus software package. AVG is decent. Komodo is also a good free antivirus solution. Microsoft Security Essentials is a good antivirus solution. All three of them are free. Now, they will not be as good as a paid-for commercial antivirus. Okay, but they're better than nothing, and they're better than McAfee. So download them, try them, see what you're comfortable with. Um, if you're really insecure, check out av-comparatives.org and look at the comparison results between all of the different antiviruses. They fluctuate depending on their definition base and how good of a job they are doing at keeping up with viruses. So that will change. And uh, that's pretty much it. I hope that answers that question real quick. What is this scary thing happening with Java? It is an exploit that Java has not yet patched, 
So what they're recommending people do is uninstall Java until it is patched. But I don't know the full details. I'm pretty sure it's a worm, and it allows for somebody to take complete control of your computer. You do not want it. Don't want it. But that's what they're recommending, that you uninstall Java in the process. So, okay. Uh, Bitmate84 adds, I tried to view a live stream on my Droid a while back, and it's never worked. I just tried now to view your live stream on my Droid at the feed tab. wasn't visible within the YouTube app, version 4.216. What a nightmare. That's messed up. So it looks like it's not letting you view the live stream through my channel, uh, through the feed tab. wasn't visible. Not visible at all? No feed? Or just the live stream wasn't? That is a discussion me and Big Nate are going to have to have outside of it because we are 10 minutes over. I think we had a great night. We had a good turnout. I appreciate all you guys showing up. It was a very, very good time for me. Um, I always have fun with this. I always have fun with this. And I always forget to switch, for, switch from my screencast to my camera, and I'm hoping to get better at that. See, if I had a guy sitting right here next to me, if I could afford to pay him, I'm just clicking little buttons as my producer then this would be so much easier. But I can't afford one. I need a slave is what I need. Somebody who will work for free other than me. So, as always, you can follow me on all the major social networks. I will be going live every weekday night at 9 p.m. This has been a lot of fun for me, and I will try to cut these videos up into segments, and I'm going to paste all this stuff we talked about into the video description. I'd like to put some timestamps on it, but... Looks like he didn't do a very good job of tracking that, so I can't make any guarantees on it. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, you can, uh, the major social networks, I have a Facebook page, Facebook profile, uh, Twitter, uh, Google+. Uh, don't forget to like the video and subscribe on YouTube. Um, and I'm really trying to come up with a way to aggregate this thing across all my networks. I'll give you guys a 10-minute heads up before the broadcast starts, and then I'll actually notify you when the broadcast officially goes live. And then you can jump on in, ask your questions again, because when you guys ask questions, it makes it a lot more fun for me because I don't have to come up with stuff to talk about. I'd rather talk about what you guys want to talk about. The whole purpose of this live stream is to interact with you guys because you guys are what keep me going. I can't, what's the point without viewership, right? And you can also send me messages through all the social networks you connect to me on, and I'll try to answer your questions. You can email me, craig at pcmtechhelp.com. I think I've gotten some spam for saying that out loud, but... Go ahead and send it to me. I have a good spam filter. And uh, I think that's it. I think that will conclude today's episode of PCM Tech Talk Live. Stay tuned. i got plenty more videos ahead, not just live, but uh, other things in the pipeline. And I will see you guys tomorrow. And hopefully it will go as well as it went tonight. Thanks again.